Governor, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Do you believe the state has enough money to uh, provide new money for classrooms in addition to enrollment growth and reduce the burden of property taxes, provide property tax relief, and if so, what should the split be? How should that new money be divided? Sure. It's in my budget. Uh, the, the way we're starting out in our budget is uh, allocating $3 billion for property tax reduction, allocating $3 billion uh, for our education programs. So $6 billion. When we talked to uh, the lieutenant governor a couple weeks ago, he said that the legislature, both houses, would probably come to $7 billion. Are you comfortable with that? I am. Yes, I, I think we can achieve it all. Listen, th this is, when it comes to the budgetary items, it's a starting point. Uh, I would not be surprised at all if it does add up to $7 billion. But listen, we can do it. Here, here, let me give you an easy example. And that is, uh, we made a priority the last couple of sessions uh, to fund roads. And we have a fund, uh, a, a road building program that costs $7.5 billion a year. And we did that by dedicating funding for it. We just do the same thing for education. Uh, education is a priority, like roads uh, are a priority. And so we dedicate funding to make sure those needs are addressed. Do you know where that, so are you talking about a new revenue stream? Not a new revenue stream, uh, a dedication of current revenue streams, uh, as well as looking at different strategies. But I, I think we can do it all uh, without imposing in, any new taxes. Uh, one question I have is the economy now is booming. Uh, undoubtedly, at some point, there may be a downturn. Is there any solid revenue, reliable revenue stream that can be put in place for schools that is recession-proof so that there won't be any billions of dollars of cuts like we saw in 2011. We are very aware uh, of the need to avoid any budget cuts from what we promise and provide. And so if we set up revenue streams, we probably will create a buffer in those revenue streams so that in the event of the eventual downturn, which will inevitably come, uh, we will not be taking money away from the teachers and education programs we will have funded. Uh, yesterday you talked about school safety and the importance of it. How important is it that the legislature provides school districts funding for school safety programs, whether it's mental health services, training for resource officers, hardening schools? That's essential, and we're going to be doing it. Uh, we'll be funding several things. Uh, one will be broadly categorized as hardening. I think it should be up to each school to decide what's best for them. Some may want metal detectors. Some may say it's the worst thing that could happen. Uh, we need to find out uh, what they need and provide resources to help them uh, with their needs. However, uh, the, the one point that everybody agrees upon is we must do a better job with mental health. Uh, there is a, a program that already exists uh, called uh, the uh, Telemedicine Wellness Program uh, used uh, by Texas Tech University uh, for schools in the Panhandle that proved to be very effective that we should take statewide, but also we need to add more mental health counselors in our schools, and we have the resources to do that. You also talked yesterday about teacher raised pay raises. Right. Should every teacher get a pay raise or only the good ones? Well, the program that I have focused on uh, is the program that's uh, used most prolifically in Dallas with uh, great success and, and great acclaim. And I've mentioned uh, DISD several times in several of my speeches, including my uh, inaugural address, where you had uh, a school that was ranked 132nd uh, in, among elementary schools in Dallas, but now ranked second. Uh, and it's because of the strategies where you put the best teachers into the most challenged classrooms. Uh, and it proved, it doesn't matter what zip code you're in, doesn't matter what the demographic background is, you can help uh, students succeed if you ha give them good teachers. And, and as the uh, superintendent of D uh, DISD says, this strategy is proven and it works over a, a meaningful number of years combined. Importantly, uh, the same strategies have been used in San Antonio, uh, in Lubbock, in Far San Juan, in Longview, different places across the state. So we know the program works, and so we want to take that statewide. So does that mean you're against having all teachers get a pay raise? Because I know that was something that the lieutenant governor said he favors. So how will you work those differences yeah, well, out? And what, that's what a session's all about, and that is for everybody to, to come to the table and bring all these different strategies to the table and, and find that the best tools and methods that we can have uh, to make sure that we are providing the best education possible for our kids. Regarding property tax reform, another emergency item and priority that you've 
Uh, today, the Texas Comptroller's Office provided information that says if HB2 and SB2 weren't enacted, that uh, the counties in Texas could lose up to $3 billion in revenues by 2024, and the cities could lose $3 billion, more than $3 billion by 2024 in potential revenues. What is your message to the local governments who aren't so happy to hear about that because they believe this hurts their impact to run their cities and, and counties? Well, when, when you think uh, the way that it's structured uh, is that it, it builds in a 2.5% increase in the amount that they're able to raise and spend every year, uh, a lot of their constituents uh, will say they wish they got a 2.5% pay raise every year. So the, the, the truth is local governments have been growing a whole lot faster than the average paycheck in Texas. And it's our citizens that we all work for that have to live within their own budget. And if, if citizens have to live within their budget, then the governments uh, also should have to live within a budget too. On border security, you talked a little bit about that yesterday during your address. Do you believe the border wall barrier fence should be expanded in Texas? And if it does get built, uh, do you believe Texas would still need to spend $800 million of its own revenues on its border security efforts? Well, first, uh, border security and immigration is a federal-based issue, not a state issue. And we are waiting for the federal government to do its job and secure a border and to fix a broken immigration system. And so, yes, we're long waiting for the day when the state will no longer have to spend state taxpayer dollars to do that. But we know that uh, border fencing or barriers, whatever you want to call it, works. We, we've seen it work. I've seen it with my own eyes work uh, on the Texas border. America saw it work uh, about a month or so ago on the border in California when the caravan got right up to California and had to stop when they got to that fence. And so without that fence, that caravan would have been able to come right across the border. We're dealing with it as we speak right now, uh, down in Eagle Pass on the border. And, and one reason why uh, we are informed Eagle Pass was chosen is because there is no barrier there. It will be very easy for people to cross the border into the United States at that location. And so this is a pressing issue that must be resolved. It's time for Congress to step up and do its job and start passing laws that fix a broken immigration system. Do you think if that does happen and they do expand the fencing and all that, that Texas would still need to spend that money, its no. own money, or no? If, if, if Congress does its job and fixes a broken immigration system uh, and puts up uh, sufficient uh, protection uh, to make sure that we are able to maintain our sovereignty, then there would be no reason for Texas to have to come out of pocket to do the federal government's job. What is your reaction to now three lawsuits uh, by various organizations against the state with regards to its uh, citizenship uh, review efforts that on, for voters? Um, they say it's unconstitutional that it targets uh, voters of color and, and naturalized citizens. Uh, what do you say to that? You know, what people are going to learn is that what the Secretary of State has been doing is following federal law and following state law. Uh, what's required by federal and state law uh, is that voter rolls uh, have to be periodically reviewed to make sure that no one who's not authorized to vote is registered to vote. And, and so uh, the problem is this, and that is the Secretary of State only has access to limited information. The Secretary of State has to get information from DPS about those who get a driver's license. But that doesn't end it because then the Secretary of State has to pass that information down to the counties who have additional information. And so it's all these different entities working together. And so all the Secretary of State was doing was acting in compliance uh, with federal and state law. You have described this as a work in progress. Uh, should, if it is a work in progress, should the Secretary of State and the Republican Party of Texas and the Attorney General have released you know, news releases you know, this early on, shouldn't that work have done, you know, gone on behind the scenes and have it finished so, you know, people wouldn't be crying foul? Yeah, I don't know who all issued news releases. All I know is what the process is. And, and it's because of, of the design of the process 
and, and because of who has access to what information, it's always a work in progress. And know this, this isn't the first time this has happened. It happens constantly because every year there are registered voters who die and pass away and no, no longer eligible, and, and their, their names have to be removed from the polls, um, from the rolls. Uh, there, there are people who may become felons uh, who have to be removed from the rolls. And we know for a fact there are people who are in the country illegally and registered to vote who need to be removed from the rolls. And so this is always, every year, a work in process, and that's a work in process that will have to continue. Maybe we need to find better, smoother ways of, of effectuating it so that it doesn't cause such a commotion. But I think we all agree on two key principles. One, no one wants anybody uh, who is ineligible to vote to cast a vote. Two, no one wants anybody who is eligible from being denied the ability to vote. Let me ask you about the 2018 election. Uh, in the Dallas area, we saw a number of Republicans lose their seats in the State House and Senate. Uh, and even in the suburbs, the northern suburbs, Collin County, uh, you had two representatives who had very close calls and a state senator, a new state senator, who was in a very close race, two-point race. So I'm wondering, how concerned are you about those results going forward? You've got 2020 coming up and then obviously 2022. What, what do you think is going on and how important is it uh, to accomplish your goals in this legislative session? Well, one thing about this session, and that is it doesn't matter if you're a Republican or Democrat, it seems like we're all agreeing upon what our needs are. Every, everyone agrees that we need to reduce property taxes. I don't care if you're a Republican or Democrat in Collin County, you want to see your property taxes go down. Uh, if you're in Collin County, you want to see your schools better funded. You want to see a reduction in Robin Hood. And so that's, that's the beauty of what's going on this session. We're talking about issues that everybody agrees upon and will coalesce around. And do you think, you know, the fact that Republicans lost so many seats or came close in Collin County, does that concern you going forward? As long as we're focusing on taking care of the needs of our fellow Texans, uh, I think we're doing the right thing and it causes no concern. All right. Governor Abbott, thank you so much. Sure. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.